welcome you to our fifth seminar this evening. And I applaud your courage in getting out in the heat, the blast furnace, and the wind tunnel to be able to get in the, in the building this evening. So we passed out your literature. Go on into the table. Come on up here and get close. There should be scripts on all of the tables and so forth. Our topic this evening is from Adam to Christ. And I want to give a brief word of introduction before we actually start flipping the pages. We have been reciting the creed every week. And part of what we say in the creed is, who for us men and our salvation. And what we have been doing for the last couple of weeks is dealing with the us that's there. Us. Who for us and our salvation. Us men meaning us mankind. The gospel is not about me. It is about us. And it is not just about us in this room. Nor is it just about us who are alive on the planet today. The us is the human species. Who for us Neolithic humans and for our salvation, the salvation of our species, for God so loved our species that he became one of us. God became a Neolithic human, us, so that we, the Neolithic human species, could become like God. And so that's why we have the title tonight, From Adam to Christ. Obviously, we don't, we're not going to have a hard time covering that much territory, let alone trying to get to us. But it's a way of including our species, who for us as a species, for all human beings on the planet that have ever been on the planet for the last 10,000 years, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven. Okay. So that's what we're going to look at this evening. And there in your next page, I, golly, we have some pretty maps and uh, so forth that are there. The top map really shows the Fertile Crescent that's there. And you have the rivers of Mesopotamia, the Tigris, and the Euphrates River. But I want you to notice that you have two lakes up here near the top. You'd have the Caspian Sea over here, all the way to the right. But this would be Lake Urmia that we talked about last time, that if you were to go up the Zagros Mountains, which is this range right here, and you had the seven gates, the seven passages, and so this is the Zagros Mountains, and we're going to discuss how, as we spilled out of the mountains, we began to make a migration downward through those seven passes, all the way down till we get to the Persian Gulf and we'll enter Mesopotamia from the south eastern end and migrate upward this direction and so forth. And then if you look in the close-up that we have right here, you can see that it's this location right here and the Persian Gulf today comes up to here and this is all filled in, but 5,000, 6,000 BC, the Persian Gulf, this hadn't been silted in, it was actually farther up, so that Eridu and Ur and Ubayid and Uruk and all of these were a bit right at the water's edge and so forth. So that's what we're going to be talking about, and I'm going to have to run tonight to cover what we're going to cover, and so there's more here than I will talk about, but I included it anyway. Everything with the kitchen sink, and you can read some of it on your own later, and it's kind of there. So that's what we're, we're dealing with. So I'm on page 96 and want to look at, from Adam to Mesopotamia, the Pottery Trail. Uh, as we've discussed last week, ancient Eden still exists. There is that rich, plush, 
plain in the mountains that still grows wonderful, uh, heavy laden fruit trees and so forth. Uh, and out of that region, if we jump down to the third paragraph, in the choicest spot in the land, or this plain of Eden, our Neolithic ancestors, Adam and Eve and their descendants, domesticated animals and invented farming. With a stable food supply, they began to multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And we have done so because we had a stable food supply. Those of you that are new tonight for the first time, just hang on. That's all I've got to say, and we'll just go on down the road the best we can this evening. Outgrowing the fruitful plain, they began migrating out of the east end of Eden into the region of Nog and began their southerly migration through the seven gates of the Zagros Mountains until they arrived on the Mesopotamian plain south of the Zagros Mountains. The so-called pottery trail is good evidence that southerly cultural migration. The oldest pottery from the 7th millennium BC comes from north of the Zagros. The next generation of pottery from the 6th millennium turns up halfway down through the Zagros. And roughly 2,000 years later, the first modern pottery appears at Iruk. That's our word of rock today the second city on earth. By then it was being mass produced on fast pottery wheels and was a poorer quality than the seventh millennium coil made originally. So right, just one quick little bit of trivia. Everyone always speculates on inventing the wheel. The wheel was not invented originally for transportation. It was invented for making pottery so we could have dishes to put our food in that we were now harvesting and cooking and so forth. And then eventually someone took a horizontal spinning wheel, made it vertical, and we had wheels that are going to come off of it. But the original wheel was a potter's wheel, was where the concept of the wheel is going to come. Anyway, top of 97, between 6,000 and 5,000 BC, our Neolithic ancestors, us, reached the Persian Gulf and discovered, discovered the marshy swampland that is at the mouth of the Euphrates River. Thick clumps of Verde reed filled the marshlands. The Verde reeds could be used to build reed houses and also boats. The marsh Arabs of Iraq still live there today and still use the reeds for the same purposes. During the regime of Saddam Hussein, uh, he set out to try to drain the marshes to kill off the marsh Arabs, and he eliminated about 50% uh, of the area, but that still exists in Iraq today, this marshy region where they have lived, the marsh Arabs have lived there from about 6,000 BC, uh, the way they did originally. This is our history. I'm wanting us to see that it's not pie in the sky, just names, as we talked about last week. We have a historical history of uh, us as human beings, and we're going to plug into that story as we begin to see the parallel with what we find in biblical text as well. Uh, the founding of the first cities, westward from where the Euphrates empties into the Persian Gulf, our ancestors entered into the plain of Mesopotamia. There they find, found an island surrounded by a freshwater lake. And on this island, they built the first city and founded the first civilization in human history. Uh, jump a paragraph. Uh, the same was true for the founder of the first city of the first civilization. His name was Enoch, which became the Semitic Hanak for founder. In Sumerian, his name is Unuk, and became the name of the famous city, Unu, Uruk, Erek. And it is from the Sumerian form of his name that modern-day Iraq gets it. They still got the same name 6,000 years later or 5,000 years later for the, the whole region that is there. The Enoch, by the way, that you read about in the pages of Genesis, he's named there as well. Uh, and I'm going to skip the next couple of paragraphs for just the sake of brevity and go to page 98. Enoch, the founder of the first Mesopotamian city, uh, named it after his son Irad, which today archaeologists call Iridu. So the name of the first city built is going to be Iridu, 
The ancient Sumerians called it Nunki, the mighty city, where Nun is mighty and Ki is city. Enoch built, the, built Erod, the city the Sumerians called Nun, or Nunki, on an island. The Egyptians also knew of this island city. Now let me just stop and take a break real quick. These guys had boats. They took the reeds and not only, they, they make mats out of them and then lay them on a mound that stuck up out of the water. The water would lap up against it, deposit its silt, and the mounds would become filled with dirt and it would begin to grow. Then they'd add more mats on top of this and it would grow. And they actually could create uh, a, an island that would seem to just rise up because it was draining the water uh, from the sides as the silt began to build up and so forth. They took the reeds and made boats and eventually made it all the way around Saudi Arabia up into the Red Sea area and into Egypt. It's the same culture, same civilization that is going to spread everywhere from these reeds uh, that were there. And so I just want to mention here this Egyptian connection because it's the same connection. Uh, and in the third paragraph there on 98, they, and this is from the inscriptions in the temples in Egypt, uh, they, the, the founder gods in their legends, planted a slip of reed in the waters of Nun. Notice the name. Then the falcon came and the reed raised him up and so the great primeval mound came into being. It is an ancient memory of the creation of this island that, that was created, as it were, out of the water. And they did it by putting the reeds there. And then just a quick comment on the island of creation. For the Egyptians, the Shemitio founder gods founded the first city and established the foundation of the primeval temple upon the island of creation. Enoch's descendants gradually expanded the island by making reed mats that they stacked at the water's edge around the edge of the island. Eventually, the mats hardened and turned to soil. By repetition of this process, the island continued to rise up from the waters. Upon this island, they built mud brick temples and buildings. The Enoch, Unaki founders, caused a city to rise from the waters, creating this island of creation uh, that is there. And we're not going to take time to read, but if you want to read it here, the inscriptions on the temples in Egypt describe that process. And the temples in Egypt all were built with the memory of coming from an island. And so this describes the process of that, and I just don't have time for us to look at all of what's there on page 99. Uh, it's just delightful stuff. But I do want to call your attention to uh, page 101. You will notice some pictures there. These are photographs of the Marsh Arabs in the swamplands of Iraq before Saddam Hussein wiped many of them out. The top picture shows all these little islands that they have put those mats on and created a, a living space that's there. In the bottom picture, you can see some of those reed boats where they have put them together. And you can see on that little island that is there, they have made their huts. You can even see it looks like uh, uh, some cattle that may be there and so forth living this way for 6,000 years. This is the way they originally began living there. And so what we're talking about and asked to imagine literally is visible. These are those little islands, but the first one is where the whole culture and civilization began to come from there at Eridu, uh, out of the swamplands of the, where the Persian Gulf was right there upon them. And it was all a swampy marshland from the Euphrates River uh, Delta area going in uh, to the region that is there. Uh, it's just delightful, wonderful history. But I do want to talk now on page 102 about the Ubaians. Our ancestors. Across southern Mesopotamia, in addition to Eridu, that's this island of creation, other islands in the midst of the marshy swamp were occupied enlarged by the reed map process and eventually became major cities of early Mesopotamian civilization. Uru, Iraq, Ur, Ubayid, Larsa, Gersu, Lagash, and Bad Tibera. Some of those were on that map that we looked at originally a while ago. 
who by it was the first of these cities excavated by archaeologists in the 1800s, who then called this period the Ubayid period that lasted approximately from 5500 to 4000 BC. So the earliest occupation was given a name by the archaeologists after that first city they excavated as the Ubayid period, and this culture was called the Ubayids. By 4500 BC, uh, Enoch's descendants, the Ubayids, had drained the swamps, dug canals, and created the first urban civilization in human history. They built reed boats, covered them with bitumen, and explored the east coast of Arabia by the sea. They would eventually spread their civil civilization around the, the Arabian Peninsula. They sailed westward up the Tigris and Euphrates and made all of Mesopotamia the land between the rivers theirs. They sailed to the Indus River in India and reached the Nile in Egypt, outward from here. Enoch, the founder, and his Unaki descendants, out of nothing, created urban civilization. It is impossible to overstate the magnitude of what they achieved. The simple Neolithic division of mankind into nomadic herders and farmers gave way to the complexities of the third category of city dwelling. And just stop and think, if we're talking us, we like to think we're linear, we've all bought into evolution, and we're progressive. And it blows us away to believe that we've been good as uh, an intellectual people from the beginning. And this Neolithic journey is a formula that we see repeated over and over and over for the last 10,000 years all across the planet. The journey from being nomadic to being sedentary as farmers, which eventually gives way to the creation of cities. We see it repeated over and over and over. And so this is our story. We are city dwellers, but most of us would have a memory of the farm life around us. Some of us may still live on farms, and so it's part of our background, if not our immediate background. And so city life is different from either the nomadic life or the life of the farmer. The nomad follows his herds. He goes where they go. The farmer stays put. He plants according to the calendar. His life is controlled by the calendar, and a feeling of determinism begins to set in. The price tag for a stable and abundant food supply is a certain loss of free will. We're talking about humanity now. The minute we don't get to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go fishing, I'm going to go hunting, or I'm going to just walk around and follow the sheep. No, I've got to go hold the garden. I've got to pull weeds. It's time for a harvest. Suddenly, our lives are beginning to be regulated because we've learned how to domesticate crops. And there's a little bit of loss of freedom that slips in to humanity. The farmer is regulated by the solar calendar, but the city dweller is regulated by the moon and the monthly cycles. We, we, everything's on a monthly basis. City life is a life of schedules. A month has weeks and days and hours and minutes. And it's Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, so where are we? Because there is a schedule that says so. And so we are here. City life is repetitious. Uh, Monday through Friday, we get up, comb our hair, brush our teeth, go to work, only to do it all over again tomorrow. And week after week after week, it's, it's this repetitious of cycles and, and so forth. Uh, the ancient Greeks thought of this in terms of the myth of Sisyphus, the guy that's going to roll the boulder up the mountain. The minute it gets there, it rolls back down. He's got to push it up. Every day, you've got to get out of bed and roll the rock up the hill. Got to go punch my time card. Get to come home. Got to go tomorrow and do it all over again. I remember being in college and thinking, why do I want to do my laundry? It's just going to get dirty. <laughs> I hated going every Saturday to the laundromat. I mean, it was... The repetition of it all was just, it wouldn't stay clean. You couldn't do it once and it'd be over with. Uh, the Semitic judgment against work and farming is found in Genesis. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles that will grow for you and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. 
There's a, there's a price tag for this agricultural life and sedentary life that we have. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau said, man is born free and everywhere he's in chains. Beginning to talk about the political chains that eventually come in. And our 21st century complaint is take this job and shove it. <laughs> We're talking humanity and it's this journey from being nomadic to being a farmer to now being urbanized city dwellers that has to have our schedules. Well, let me give us a quick historical footnote of ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, following the Islamic conquest at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, knowledge of the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia uh, was forgotten in the West. For almost 2,000 years at least, the past was buried beneath the sands of Iraq. Beginning in the 1850s, Western European archaeologists began excavating ancient Mesopotamia. No one knew anything. Stuff we've already talked about, no one knew existed in, before 1850. It wasn't on the charts. The discovery of King Tut's tomb in Egypt in 1922 captured the imagination of the West, and a fascination with things Egyptian continues to the present day. The discoveries of Mesopotamia, though greater in antiquity, and ultimately far greater in historical value of understanding the ancient Neolithic past, once more were, for all intents and purposes, forgotten in the West. They were like the, uh, the Ark put in the box at the end of the movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, it just stuck away on a shelf in a museum somewhere. Uh, the Sumerian Tales legend, I'm looking at the second paragraph on 104, the Sumerian Tales legends and songs are part of a vast literature inscribed on clay tablets and fragments scattered throughout museums the world over. Their contents, which date back at least to 2000 BC, are now in the process of being deciphered, translated, and interpreted by a small international group of dedicated scholars. Gradually, they are becoming available in one form or another to the world at large. Inscribed on these tablets and fragments, numbering some five to 6,000 in all, are hundreds of compositions, myths, epic tales, hymns, psalms, love songs, laments, essays, disputations, proverbs, fables, that constitute a treasure house of comparative source material for the historian of literature and religion, for the biblical and classical scholar, and for the folklorist and cultural anthropologist. In other words, we never knew it was there. We finally go find it, and we put it in boxes, and they're buried in museums all over the world, and are still some of them have not yet been translated or published or put into a readable form for we, the average guy in the book, who doesn't understand or read cuneiform and Assyrian and those kinds of things. Now I want to mention one other quick historical footnote. Let's talk about Jonah for just a second, because we bump into him walking through Mesopotamia. Beginning in 1845, Sir A.H. Layard excavated the ancient city of Nineveh, which many thought had never existed and was invented because the only place it was mentioned was in the story of Jonah. But he found it and began to excavate it. But at this city where Jonah preached, uh, and Nineveh is located on the Tigris River across from Mosul. You'll hear that in the news because of the war going on. Nearby Nineveh, is the Tal Nabi Yunus, the hill of Jonah, is its name. On all the maps, going as far back as we got maps, the hill is called the hill of Jonah, from which the prophet Jonah preached repentance to the inhabitants of Nineveh. Having in view the greater Zab Tigris waterway, we think that the mentioning of the unusual fish in the river is very significant. This is not a figment of imagination in a legend but represents reality. In fact, there, air, there is in these regions a certain species of fish that is unusually large for a river. Before the Second World War, I have, I have had personal experience of seeing some of these giant fish about two meters long. What is that, six, seven feet, maybe? Uh, that were brought to Mosul, cut into pieces and sold. It was incredible indeed that such a huge fish could live and grow in a river. There is an interesting tradition in that part of the country today, which I think must be somewhat related to the existence of this fish of uncommon size. Near Mosul, on the small hill of the ruins of Nineveh, there is a village called Nebi Yunus, the hill of Jonah. 
on the mosque of this village, built on the site of the oldest Christian monasteries that stand on the ruins of a pagan temple, in a deep and dark room there is hanging from a wall a big bone, which the natives traditionally believe belonged to the fish that swallowed the prophet Jonah. I just throw that out there. I'm going, what? Where in the world? There's a hill named after Jonah, and there's a bone on the wall, and people can go see this thing, and as they're digging for Nineveh, they bumped into Jonah. So we just bumped into Jonah as we're not going to go look for Nineveh. Okay, that's okay. And when they got to Nineveh, I'm looking at item F now on page 105. At Nineveh, they discovered the royal library of Ashurbanipal, who was mentioned in the pages of the Old Testament, by the way, who became king in 669 B.C. Ashurbanipal was greatly interested in the literature of the Sumerians, that is, the non-Semitic people who occupied Lower Babylon about 3500 B.C. and later. He and his scribes made bilingual lists of signs and words and objects of all classes and kinds, and he set out and they got copies of every document they could do, and they made dual copies of things, and then they put a dictionary together to translate them back and forth, and they found his library. They found his library uh, in, in 1854, right before the American Civil War. Someone found this ancient library. Uh, it took until 1872 to get it translated and put into writing. And in 1872, on item number two now, in 1872, George Smith published descriptions of what he had found that included the Epic of Gilgamesh and an account of the flood in more than one version a detailed description of creation and the seven tablets of creation and the legend of the descent of Ishtar into Hades in quest of Tammuz. In the eleventh tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh gives an account of a great flood that covered the land. Uh, it's there are four or five different versions in four or five different languages all talking about this huge flood that was there. Top of 106, it is not too much to assume that the original event Commemorated in the legend of the deluge was a serious and prolonged inundation or flood in Lower Babylonia, which was accompanied by a great loss of life and destruction of property. It was the first time outside of the pages of the Bible that anyone ever knew there had been a huge, mighty destructive flood at some place on the planet. And when it says in Genesis it covered the earth, it, nobody understood a globe in those days. If we had a flood in, uh, in central Oklahoma and we were up on the ch ch dome of the church here because that's where we had to get to behind it, and every direction we looked for 100 miles there was water, what would we say? Water covered the face of the earth. It's, it's a common description. We try to force the Bible into saying things that it wasn't saying. It, it was talking about it was, there was water as far as we could see. It was a huge destructive event. And it wasn't just a quick event, it was a water event that stayed and stayed and, and, and stayed. It started going, wow, there was a flood after all. Well then let's talk about the Sumerian Kings list. The Sumerian Kings list, the SKL, is a list of rulers or dynasties from the first kingship at Eridu, remember the island of creation? After kingship had descended from heaven, Eridu became the seat of kingship. And the SKL, this king list, is significant for at least two points. First, the list of kings is interrupted by a flood, with eight kings or dynasties listed before the flood and 35 kings or dynasties after the flood. So here is a second source that's got just a chronological listing of dynasties, and it's going to say these were before the flood, and then the flood came, and all of these are after the flood. He was the first ruler after a huge event, this flood was. The, fl the, the flood then swept over. After the flood had swept over and kingship had descended from heaven, Kish became the seat of kingship after the flood. The second point of significance are the length of rule assigned to the king's dynasties. The list blends earlier, possibly mythical kings who have exceptionally long reigns with later, more plausibly historical dynasties. Cannot be ruled out that earlier names in the list correspond to historic rulers who later became legendary figures. An ancient literary custom was to exaggerate the length of rule as a way of signifying the importance of the ruler. This same literary custom may be at work in the lifespans given in Genesis 5 before the flood and Genesis 11 
after the flood. The earliest name on the list whose existence has been authenticated through recent archaeological discoveries is that of a guy with a really long, hard name for Kish, about 2600 B.C. The fact that his name is also mentioned in the Gilgamesh epics has led to speculation that Gilgamesh himself could be historic. In addition to Gilgamesh, who is the fifth king after the flood, Enmerkar, remember we talked about him last time, Enmerkar, the Lord of Arata, sending his emissary to Eden. He is listed as the second king after the flood. So we've got all kinds of stories about a flood in other versions and other languages. We've got a Sumerian king list that's interrupted by a flood. And then we come to the royal tombs of Ur. Leonard Woolley excavated the royal tombs of Ur in the 1920s and the 1930s. I'm on page 107. One digging yielded a dramatic discovery, a 3.7 meter, about 12 feet thick layer of water-laid clay that sealed strata containing painted pottery of the Ubayid period, the earliest known phase of occupation in southern Mesopotamia. What this means is that they're digging down and they went through all of the places they had pottery and artifacts, and they came to what looked like native virgin soil. And Woolley had the digger keep digging. And he dug. And he dug. He dug down 12 more feet through just clay, water-laid clay, mud, dried mud. And when he got past the 12-foot mark, he got into pottery again, and it was of a different culture and age than the pottery above the mud. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Twelve feet of this stuff, and there's a different... And it was the Ubayid pottery underneath. That's that first level. That's the Eridu group and all those original cities that are there. And so his flood may not have been the flood, but it's evidence that there had been a flood and subject to flood there. And one of the things he found was uh, Queen Puhabi, her tomb, and her headdress was found. And if you look on the next page, uh, this is part of what he found in the royal tombs there in the city of Ur. This is part of our story. This isn't just abstract stuff. We're not talking about just a bunch of dead people from the past. I'm wanting us to see that we're us, the descendants of Adam, spread outward. Uh, even in the book of Genesis, it talks about Enoch building the first city. It talks about having a son named Erod. That's Eridu. Uh, it, it's all there. Uh, and it's also here in uh, the history of Mesopotamia. Somehow got left out of all of our college humanities textbooks when we studied it, by the way. I hmm. wonder how that happened. Okay. Well, golly, we are in Mesopotamia. There's evidence of a flood. What do you mean the Tower of Babel? Well, let's see about that on page 109. The Temple of Eridu. Remember the island of creation where we started this process? This is from the Lord of Arata. Uh, to in Imrakar to the Lord of Arata. This is part of that text. Let the people of Arata artfully fashion gold and silver. Let them bring down precious stone and pure lapis lazuli. Let the people of Arata build for me, that is supply for me, a great temple. Set up for me a great shrine of the gods. Fashion for me the Abzu, like holy highland. Purify me, Eridu, like a mountain. On the island of creation at Eridu had been built the first temple shrine. Over the centuries, the tiny shrine had been superseded by mud brick temples of increasing grandeur. By Enmerkar's time, the 17th temple building stood several meters directly above Enoch's little shrine, with all the temples in between acting as the foundation for the latest edifice. This was the sacred cult center of the Abzu, which Enmerkar of Uruk wished to rebuild and adorn with the wondrous products of Arata. This was no minor renovation project. 
In Merkar wanted to build a great temple, a great shrine of the gods, and so the people of Sumer began to erect a huge mud brick platform which rose above the surrounding marshes like a mighty tower. This was the first ziggurat in Mesopotamia, a mountain home for all the gods constructed down in the flat alluvial plain. The story of the building of this great temple is found in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. It's also found in Josephus, and it is found in the Sumerian myth known as Ninurtu's Pride and Punishment. In every version of the story, the massive building effort was brought to a sudden and premature end because of the arrogance and pride of the builder. There on page 110 is an artist's rendition of the Tower of Babel that was planned there, the Temple of Eridu, based on best archaeological reconstruction that is there. If you look on page, the next page, 111, this is what is left of it about uh, 6,000 years later. It is this huge mound uh, reduced to dirt and rubble that would have to be excavated. It really existed, and even there you can see how huge it's left after 6,000 years of erosion, or 7,000 years of erosion have taken over. But now look on page 112 with me. Let's talk about the ziggurats of Babylon. Someone got an aspirin. I just saw someone with a headache. Oh, why did I do this? <laughs> oh, man. I just wanted to talk about Jesus tonight. <laughs> We're going to get to the religious side. I'm just laying again the foundation. Following the example of Inmarkar's building a mountain, so the gods of the mountains could now come and dwell on the plains of Mesopotamia. Man-made mountains eventually spread across Mesopotamia and became the basis for the pyramids in Egypt and elsewhere around the world. The key difference with the pyramid is it was a tomb that you buried somebody in, whereas the ziggurats were temples that you worshipped the gods from. These man-made mountains were called ziggurats, a name suggested by the Zagros Mountains, like a cigar and a cigarette are the same word. Zagros for the mountains and a ziggurat, a ziggurat for the man-made version down with man-made bricks. The city of Ur was not far from Eridu. You saw that on that map we looked at. They're almost cousin sister cities. Eventually, Ur also built a ziggurat for itself. The remains of the ziggurat at Ur still remains, unless it's been blown up in the last five years. A partial restoration had begun in the late 20th century. Ur was Abraham's hometown. So when we start talking about Abraham, he's not just mythological. He lived in the city of Ur. And the city of Ur has got this giant man-made mountain called a ziggurat that is there. And if you want to flip the page, you can see it. At the top of the page, you will see the artist's sketch of what it originally looked like. And then you can see a photograph of the partial restoration of it that was begun in the 20th century. Uh, I've seen another picture that's got an old car in it to give you some perspective of the size of how huge this, and this one was built after Eridu, and you can see that the erosion has been, they cleared away, this one looked like Eridu, and they came in and dug away all of the sand that had blown up against it and off of it and began to then rebuild. This is what Abraham saw every day of his life. Ur, this huge city with a huge man-made temple that was there, this, the city that was, was there. Well, part one was to get us from Adam to Mesopotamia, Adam to Abraham. Now that we've gotten to Abraham, let's go from Abraham to Moses, if we can. I don't know if I can do it in 15 minutes, but we'll see how fast we can, we can do this. 
Abraham probably lived around 1800 B.C. He, he starts off, and I, and I haven't got time to, to, I hope you know some of the, the Bible history of this, but if here's the Tigris, Euphrates River, and here's Turkey, and this is the eastern end, and this is the Nile River, Ur is right here. Essentially, he and his family are going to migrate northward to here to Haran. Abraham and his family and his nephew Lot are going to head southward into Canaan. Eventually, he'll go as far as Egypt before turning around and coming back and settling here. And the rest of the story is going to take place. The entire biblical story of the Old Testament takes place in a circle right here. From Ur to Haran, Palestine, Egypt, and back. He comes here. Sarah gets pregnant, has a son named Isaac. They send back to Haran. Uh, every immigrant group always sends back home to the old country for a wife. And so they did for Isaac, and you get Rebecca. Uh, they have children. Uh, Rebecca helps one of the sons deceive Isaac. His name is Jacob. He's got to run for his life. Where does he run? He runs back up to Haran, where his uncle lives. Uh, he's going to end up getting two wives and two concubines, and out of four women, he's going to have 12 sons and I don't know how many daughters. Now, the 12 tribes of Israel are going to... You've got to read Genesis. I haven't got time to tell it. But anyway, you saw here, and the 11th son born to Jacob, first son to his wife Rachel, is named Joseph. Joseph is a spoiled brat. Uh... He's the daddy's favorite, and uh, the kid, his older brothers know it, and he lets them have it over and over and over and over. Eventually, they get tired of it, and so they plot to kill him and just sell him into slavery to make some money off the deal. And he goes to Egypt, goes through different episodes there, eventually comes to the attention of Pharaoh, interprets a dream to Pharaoh, essentially saying, we're going to have seven years of abundant harvest, followed by seven years of severe famine, where there will be no harvest, and if you are smart, you will institute a massive building program, program to buy up all the grain, uh, store it, and have enough on hand to last through the years of uh, famine that are coming. And Pharaoh is going to say, this is wonderful, and appoint Joseph to be second in command, the governor of Egypt, if you will, to institute this building program. And you can find his, his part of that story in Genesis 41 in the verses that are listed there. Joseph, once in command, is going to undertake, one, building these granaries to store massive amounts of grain in. Huge granaries he's going to build. Secondly, he will build a canal that will divert floodwaters from the Nile into an artificial lake that is called Lake Morris, I guess. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Lake Morris still exists today, as does the nine kilometer kilometer canal, which is to this day still called by its traditional name, Bar Yusef, the Canal of Joseph. Still there in Egypt, the lake is there, the canal is there, the street sign is there the canal of Joseph. There are going to be the lean years, and the lean years were not caused by a drought, like they might be in Oklahoma. They were actually caused by a flood. The Nile River floods every year. That's what softens the soil, and you get to plant. But if you have a massive flood, and the water stays too long, you never get to plant. We found considerable number of inscriptions from the 12th and 13th dynasties. Many of them were intended to indicate the highest rising of the Nile during a series of years, especially in the reigns of uh, these two kings. For about 60 years, starting in the reign of one of those kings and lasting down to the early 13th dynasty, the highest point to which the Nile flood reached in a given year was marked by a short hieroglyphic inscription on the rock face of a gorge. They actually were putting marks on the side of the... The, the mountain, the rocks where the river would come through to mark how high it got every year. 
and they were able to average the height that it normally was. Uh, and I don't know if I included it all in here. Uh, maybe at the top of page 115, at the end of the second decade, uh, the annual flood suddenly rose to 21 meters, and an inundation of the Nile Valley continued to drown the land for weeks beyond its due time. Uh, seed could not be planted, so the harvest was badly affected. A severe famine would have rapidly ensued if Joseph had not persuaded the king to store vast quantities of grain harvested during the period of plenty. Local landowners who did not heed Joseph's warning found their own silos empty during the lean years. They were forced to sell their lands to the king for food. The power of the king, should say king, became the sole power in the land. So Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. That's from Genesis 47, 20. You had granaries were built to store the plentiful harvest. Amenemhat's pyramid, in which he was buried at Hawara, stands beside the ruins of one of the most impressive buildings of the ancient world, the Egyptian labyrinth built during his reign. This is the reign of Joseph, by the way. I have seen it, and indeed no words can describe its wonders. Though the pyramids were greater than words can tell, and each one of them a match for many great monuments built by the Greeks, this maze surpasses even the pyramids. That's written by the Greek historian Herodotus. He's talking about this massive granary that has been discovered. It's got room after room to store. Didn't go up like a silo, it went out horizontally, just massive structure that is there. They not only have excavated that granary that was built, they've also located where Joseph lived in northern Goshen in the northern end of the Nile Delta. Manfred Bietak, director of the Institute for Egyptology in Vienna and field director of the Austrian mission to Tel Adarba, which is Avaris in Egypt, at Tel Adarba, Bietek discovered a large Egyptian-style palace to which was attached a beautiful garden. The elegant palace was originally erected as a residence for the vizier Joseph in the original capital of Avaris, the headquarters of the Delta administration known as the Department of the North. And at this palace, they found the garden tomb. The palace had a garden. In the garden, a tomb was uncovered of typical Egyptian style. It was found to be almost empty, having been broken into long ago. However, BTAC did discover the desecrated remains of a twice life-size colossus or statue of the occupant of the tomb and palace. The tomb was in the shape of a small pyramid, but it was clear that the vault was broken into and the remains removed. However, the damage to the tomb was not like that done by the all too common grave robbers of Egypt. It appears to be a careful and methodical removal of bricks from the tomb. Someone took the top off of this gently for the purpose of removing the coffin, uh, the mummified coffin there. It says in Exodus, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God shall surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here when you go. You'll notice that if you watch the movie The Ten Commandments, as the Exodus is beginning to happen, there goes one of those uh, Egyptian mummy cases is being carried out as they're carrying Joseph with them. They would have come to his tomb, dismantled the top, taken the casket out, the coffin with them, and would have carried it with them. Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem. The Joseph Stone, the statue. Our historian and archaeologist, Dorothea Arnold, of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, presented a lecture at the British Museum Colloquium in July 2004. In her lecture, Arnold had focused much of her time on the severely mutilated head and shoulders from a colossal statue of an Asiatic official of the 12th dynasty. Asiatic would mean north, the Semitic races north of Egypt. Uh, on an Asiatic official of the 12th dynasty, contemporary with the reign of Amenahat III and his successor. She pointed out the significance of this remarkable image found by Manfred Bittak in a tomb located behind a palace belonging to the earliest settlement at Avaris. 
According to Arnold, this was one of the most important discoveries of the last quarter of a century in Egypt. The high official of state was no ordinary person with his flame red hair, pale yellow skin, and multicolored coat. Then Arnold surprised us all by proclaiming, some have identified this statue as Joseph, the Israelite visor of Pharaoh in the book of Genesis. In front of the pyramid, a small chapel was added to house the seated cult statue of Egypt's savior. It too painted to represent the Asiatic visor in his famous coat of many colors. This was no ordinary statue. It was nearly three meters high. It depicted Joseph in his prime with flame red hair, pale yellow skin tone to indicate his northern origins, and a throw stick held across the right shoulder as a symbol of high office, but also clearly marking him out as an Asiatic and not an Egyptian servant of Pharaoh. The body of the statue was painted as if wrapped in the full length robe of the visor, but it was a visor's cloak of a very different kind, decorated in an elaborate pattern of reds, blues, blacks, and whites to present the woven coat of many colors of the Middle Bronze Age Asiatic chieftain. A picture of the reconstruction of the Joseph statue you'll find on the next page. <coughs> I've been trying to make one point, I think, for about uh, five weeks now. It's all historically true. It is not pie in the sky stuff. If we say someone lived, he had to live somewhere. And he had to live in a when, in a time period. They may or may not have left artifacts that we can People that are nomads typically don't. People who do not have this kind of money aren't going to build a tomb in the backyard and have a nine foot tall statue carved that's going to remind others. We, we have our military heroes and we have statues like that in, in our shrines in, in Washington, D.C. and so forth or in, in our capital here of Will Rogers and others and so forth. But the average person doesn't. It takes extraordinary people to be able to, to do this. So in our one hour together, we have just now gone from 8,000 B.C. to about 1600 B.C. And we have the descendants of Abraham having come to Egypt because they did have a drought in their part of the world and are starving, not knowing Joseph, their son, and brother is alive, will come there and have a reunion with him. And Jacob, who is still alive, and his sons and their wives and their children, uh, about 70 some people in all, are now going to journey and live in Egypt. And after the break, we're going to meet Moses and see if we can get out of Egypt and come back to Palestine. We'll take a break now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. What is happening in our story is that out of this mass of humanity that is going to be birthed, because we now have food and we live and our species is multiplying and covering the whole planet, that out of that process, there begins to be the interaction of an unknown deity with a certain family. Abraham is in Ur. His father says, let's move. And as part of a general migration of people, there were others making the same move. But for Abraham, he begins to say, this God interrupts my life and says, come on, let's go. And so he leaves his parents behind here and is going to start this journey. And all the way through, whether it's Isaac or whether you're talking Jacob, uh, Jacob's going to wrestle on his way, fleeing from his brother to go back up where he eventually will meet his uncle 
On his way there, he will stop and spend the night, and during the night he wrestles with this unknown deity. He will dislocate his hip in the process and will limp from then on. And this deity will, in effect, change his name from Jacob to Israel. Israel meaning one who wrestles with God or one who struggles with God. And this deity is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This God had kept interrupting our grandparents' lives and has impacted us. And, and so there is an unfolding of a story here inside this one family, if you will, and the descendants of that one family. And so what we're doing now with Joseph onward, we started with Abraham, and we've gotten to Joseph, is beginning to just follow the family. Let's see what happens with this one family and this, this strange unknown God. Everybody's got gods. These people have got gods. Those people, and most of the gods are uh, part of the, an ethnic group. And there's all kinds of gods. And you can worship as many as you wanted. And, and different ones were your favorites and so forth. But the strange thing here is, here is a God looking for worshipers. I'm looking for somebody that I will be their God and they will be my people. Uh, it's like tapping somebody on the shoulder and saying, can I be your God? I'll be your God. It's this wonderful story of having been created with the VMAT2 spiritual gene that we talked about. And the telephone keeps ringing inside of us, and we don't know how to answer it. And when we finally answer it, we don't know the name of the guy on the other end. We don't know the name of who, who caller ID doesn't tell us. Who is this deity that keeps interrupting their lives, interrupting our lives? Well, I'm going to run through about 1,500 years of history in the little time that we have left, so we can just... This will summarize our history. Next week, we're going to deal then with the results of Christ. We're going to deal with our salvation. We're going to deal with events that have impact we, us, as believers. But if we don't have an historical Christ, it's just all legend and myth and fiction. So that's what we're doing establishing the historical reality of our faith beginning with Abraham, beginning with Adam, and so forth. Moses is going to live approximately 1500 BC. All of these dates, by the way, are part of the new chronology that the new scientists are coming up with. The old dates have only existed since about 1850. They were invented dates. They were the best guess that they could make. And if somebody dates something in Egypt, how in the world do you make that correspond with something in Mesopotamia or something in Greece? And the dating system is all crazy all over the place. And so these new uh, chronologists are coming along and using DNA evidence. They're using drillings in the, solar, in the polar ice cap where you have different uh, volcanic explosions that have taken place and the ash from that is at the North Pole and you can drill down and find it and they can date that and can tell when these events happen. There's an entire new dating system coming into existence. And so all of the things that were ever written about biblical history being hogwash because of the dates, you can just go burn all the books. I mean, they're, they're just, they're useless to us anymore because, the, well, we just saw the Joseph statue. Okay. I gotta hurry. The Exodus with Moses is going to happen about 1450 BC. That happens to be the time when the volcano at Thero, Santo, Santorini, blows up, eliminates the entire Minoan culture. Sure 
sends a tsunami across the eastern end of the Mediterranean that goes across the Upper Nile Delta into the Sinai Peninsula, and they're still, in the last two years, discovering the volcanic pumice that floated all the way there on that tsunami. Very real possibility it would have wiped out an entire Egyptian charioteer army when it hit. There is at least, from a the climate point of view, from a volcanic point of view, events that suggest a massive amount of water suddenly pouring across it. And it doesn't have to be like in the movie The Ten Commandments, 500 feet tall. We saw the tsunami on television, didn't we? The one that had in Indonesia two years ago, three feet high, killed how many hundred thousand people with the force that was there. It doesn't have to be Hollywood's version to be able to completely horse and rider thrown into the sea. That talks about this here. Anyway, the volcano, I mean, the, the volcano explodes may well be historical basis for the wiping out of Pharaoh as they're crossing. They didn't cross through, it's a mistranslation, the Red Sea that crossed through the northern end of it, the Reed Sea, the marshy part where the pumice is being found and, 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 and so forth. They wander around for 40 years and then they're going to begin the conquest of Palestine. They're going to come up here and from the east, the present day land of Jordan, they're going to come in from the east, cross the Jordan River and begin the conquest of this area. They're going to displace part of the population that's there. That will begin around 410 BC and they're going to enter into a period of a loose tribal confederation known biblically as the period of the judges. These are people, and let me, this is exciting. We can talk about the Neolithic formula going from being nomadic to being farmers to being urbanized and creating governments. But when you look at the Old Testament, we actually have the history of a people going through the Neolithic formula. They are nomads. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are nomadic peoples. They're, they, they're here uh, really semi-nomadic while they're in Egypt, but while they wander for 40 years, they're nomadic again. When they come into Canaan in the conquest, they divide the land up, and this tribe's over here, this one's over there. They're tribal confederation. There is no government. They are still essentially nomadic. The Ark of the Covenant is still in a tent. They are still tent dwellers. But once they are there, they begin to have neighbors that are farmers. And they begin to be acclimated. They begin to buy grain, they begin to eventually become farmers themselves. And when they do, a religious tug of war is going to happen because this unknown God, remember Moses had to say, what's your name? This God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a nomadic God. He's the God that's been with them on the journey. But the agricultural gods are new gods. They're male and female fertility gods, praying for the harvest, praying for a great crop. You've got shrines. And, and so as they became farmers, they began to abandon the nomadic god in favor of these agricultural deities that are already here. Of course, we're here and there and here and there. We got a Mardi Gras this month. We got one next month. It just, you know, it, it's part of the world we now live in. And so you begin to get a religious tug of war that, that happens during this period. And eventually, after about 400 years of this, they have not only become farmers, they have become urbanized enough, city dwellers enough, that they demand a government. Let's have a king like everybody else. Let's be a people. That's the Neolithic formula. We go from being nomadic, tribal, we begin to be farmers, and then we 
create cities, and the minute you do, you got to have laws, you got to have government, you got to have taxes. Yikes! Uh, the whole process it begins to start, and and so here it is. And this tug of war, over and over and over. Remember, David is finally building great palaces uh, for himself, but he wants to build a house for God. Solomon's going to build that first temple, that first house for God. They're, they're, they're becoming city-fied and they're, they're, they're settling down and, 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 and so forth. And you get to Solomon maybe by about 1000 BC. Uh, Solomon dies and, and, and Solomon had, you know, had all these wives and they all had their four deities and he built a different temple for every one of them. He built lots of temples, not just for uh, the unknown God, the nomadic God. He built temples for all the other gods as well. Uh, but, but when he died, his son takes over, and his son wanted a new Maserati and wanted to go uh, vacationing in Aruba, and that cost money, and you realize I'm stretching him just a little. All right. You never know if someone's taking that as literal as it. He, 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 he had needs, and the coffers were empty, so let's raise taxes, and we're now going to have a civil war, and the ten tribes, the ten northern tribes, uh, if, if, if this is the kingdom of Israel, and it's been divided among tribes, the ten northern tribes are now going to split, have a civil war, if you will. We're gone. We're out of here. And they will become their own country with their own king and their own temple. And they will take the name Israel with them. The northern kingdom, now that we have a divided monarchy, and the southern area has only two tribes. And of the two, Judah is the biggest of the two tribes. And so that becomes the name of the southern kingdom. It's the kingdom of Judah, which is really just a tribe. And so we have the divided monarchy here. And you have then, I think I put in the dates, the northern kingdom is going to survive 960 to about 721. It will be conquered by Assyria. The people will be deported. And uh, we'll never hear from them again. That's where you can buy all these books that talk about the ten lost tribes of Israel. They're not lost. They're just gone. They went into slavery, intermarried themselves out of existence, and they no longer have an ethnic uh, identity you know, anywhere. And during this period, this is the period where in the north, prophets begin to happen. You begin to have these prophets come into existence where this they're minding their own business. Some of them are out plowing in the fields. Some of them are picking figs. They're, they're just doing daily life and They'll feel this, the deity come and tap them on the shoulder and say, I got a job for you. Would you please go tell the king he's a fink? That's a dangerous thing to do. But many of them would do this thing. And it began to be a protest movement that we've abandoned our God. I wonder where all that noise is coming from. Anybody here besides me? Uh, maybe we can push the button over there that's got them joined, or we've got somebody's in the sanctuary on the mics or something. It sounds like a nursery. Do we have a microphone? Okay, quick, maybe. I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. Someone's listening on the tape of this. Uh, they're going to wonder what was going on, and if they couldn't pick it up, then okay. <laughs> um, you begin to have a, a, a this, the prophets calling the people back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And essentially, they began to look at what God has been doing with them. And they tried to understand what is happening. And when they are destroyed by the Assyrians, a bunch of the religious people of the north head south as refugees. 
And when they come south, they bring with them a concern that we cannot abandon our God. And essentially, they take the name, or given the name by historians now, as the Deuteronomic historians. They begin to look backward over their entire history, all the way back, especially to that period of the judges. Because when they lived then without a king, they saw that when they obeyed God, served Him, worshipped Him, they prospered. But when they started hanging around the agricultural deities, abandoned their God, calamity would happen. An enemy would come along. They'd get spanked politically. But when they repented and returned to their nomadic God, he would raise up a deliverer. Samson, Deborah, or this one, or that one, who would rescue them militarily, and they would have prosperity again. And that began to be the understanding. They're going, wow, look what our history means. And they actually invented history. The looking at history to see if it has meaning was invented not by the Greeks, but by the ancient Israelites. And they said, let's put together our history. Let's write our history from that perspective. Let's write a Deuteronomic history. And this happened in the southern kingdom during the reign of a king named Josiah. And what they did was they wrote an introductory book. They wanted to remind a contemporary generation of the old days when they first got their contract with God under Moses. And so they wrote a book that is a summary of the contract. And they used Moses as the figure, and it's kind of Moses' farewell speech to the people before they go into the promised land under Joshua. And because it recapitulates that story, it's called Deutero, second, no law, second statement of the law, and it's called Deuteronomy. And it is suddenly discovered way over here in about, uh, I don't know, it was after 721, might have been around 680 or so, I forget the date. They discovered this book. Here's a book. It's kind of like reading The Hobbit before you read the trilogy. Uh, it's the intro. It sets the stage for here's the covenant. And then you have Joshua. And they tell, they took the story of Joshua, and they said, so you don't miss it. We don't want you to miss it. You know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then you go from, then you begin to look at the judges. Joshua judges, and when you look at judges, over and over and over again, they make sure that we, the reader, don't miss it. That when we obey our God and are faithful to worshiping Him, we prosper. And when we abandon Him, we lose His favor and protection and get spanked. But if we repent, He will forgive us and we will prosper again. As this shoe, that's a golden age for them. Then you're going to get the story of Ruth in here because... The great King David is going to come, and she was his great grandmother in, in, the, in the process. And so you, but you begin, and then you're going to get first and second Samuel, the journey towards the king, kingship, and the first king Saul, and then the coming of King David, and then Solomon, and the Davidic covenant that comes into existence. Then you get into first and second kings, it's going to deal with the split of the northern kingdom and so forth. And when you read that about the northern kingdom, it's going to say so-and-so became king, 
and he served, uh, he was king for X number of years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he died, it was, his bones were buried to his father, next king, da 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 and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And what happens in the northern kingdom is, look at them, they're gone. And so the southern kingdom begins to hear this message and creates this understanding of their own history. Look what our God has been doing with us. Let's wake up. The phone is ringing here. And so they suddenly say, if we can repent, and now you get the prophet Jeremiah, who is going to be one of these uh, Deuteronomy preachers, who's preaching this gospel, calling for repentance. And if we don't repent, judgment is coming. Bad things are going to happen. Are going to happen. They don't repent. And so in uh, 586 B.C., we're at item number C under J, 586 or K, uh, the Babylonian Empire, they're over here again, has now gotten strong all over again, comes through and conquers Palestine, destroys the temple, and takes the people off into exile all the way back to Babylon. Some will escape to Egypt, and there will begin to be a large Jewish population on the Nile River in Egypt, but a massive group will be taken to uh, Babylon, and at the time of the present Iraqi war, there were still Jewish descendants of that group still living in Babylon. Now, they have almost been obliterated since then, and may now be gone, but at the time of the start of the war, there was a sizable Jewish population, many of them descendants of the original Israelites, carried off in the deportation uh, in uh, 586. Now they are there in Babylon and they've got a theological crisis. Oh my goodness, we've worshipped this deity. Has it all been a lie? We're gone. Our land's gone. Our temple's gone. Our nation's gone. Our identity's gone. And thank God for the Deuteronomic historians who said, no! It has not been a lie. We didn't eat chili beans and dream this all up. <laughs> Our lives really have been interrupted by this deity. And if we will repent here in Babylon as a people, even as captives in Babylon, if we will repent, our God will hear us and will act in our behalf and will send a deliverer who will rescue us so we can once again be his people. Jeremiah sent a letter to those exiles in Babylon and said, plant gardens, build houses, give your children and your daughter to each other in marriage. Let them get married. You're going to be there 70 years. Bloom where you're planted, and God will bring you home. 70 years later, in about 516 B.C., Iran got power. This is modern history back then. It's the same story going on in our lifetime. Iran gets powerful. Cyrus the, uh, the Persian comes to power. And he gets his army together and he marches on Babylon and conquers Babylon. And what does he do? He says, all you captive people, if you want to go home, we're going to arrange it. And the Bible calls Cyrus the Messiah, the deliverer, the one raised up by God to deliver his people. And he wasn't Jewish. He was not an Israelite. And so a portion decide to come back and leave here and come back and begin rebuilding their lives, rebuilding their cities and rebuilding the temple. And when that group came back from Babylon, they brought two things with them. They brought the collection of their writings that today we call the Old Testament. 
And at the core of that is the Deuteronomic history and the prophets who had prophesied. So you don't miss it that our God is a God looking for a people. I will be your God. You can be my people. And that covenant relationship would be at the core of this. They brought that back. And secondly, they brought back the synagogue. They brought back, not, there was no temple in Babylon. And in Babylon they had created a way to worship called the synagogue where they would first of all gather and read a selected portion of scripture, the Old Testament. They would uh, sing, uh, they would have a homily on that passage. They would then sing out of the book of Psalms. And then finally they would recite their formal prayers. So that was their worship service that they would do in the synagogue and bring them back with them. And they will come back then in 516 and return to Palestine and begin to rebuild. About 200 years later, and I'm now on page 120, 200 years later, Alexander the Great from Greece, from Macedonia, comes through and conquers the region in 332. He goes all the way into Egypt and is not only going to, wow, what a map. He's going to come from here, conquer all of this, and conquer down here in Alexandria. In fact, Alexandria, he built the city, named it after himself, founded the city. That's where the name comes from. And in Alexandria, you have a sizable Jewish population living there. And they will begin a conversation with the Hellenistic world, the Greek world. The, the, the Greeks bring Plato, and the Israelites, the Jews, have Moses and the Deuteronomy historian saying, I will be your God, you will be my people. And so they say, let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation between Moses and Plato. Well, in order to do that, you have to speak the same language. And so in Alexandria, beginning in by at least 285 B.C., they begin translating all of the Israelite writings that we call the Old Testament. They translated them into Greek. And that book is called the Septuagint, abbreviated the Septuagint, meaning 70, and it is the oldest extant version of the Israelite old scriptures in existence. Not in Hebrew, it exists in Greek, in its oldest extant version. The oldest copy of an Old Testament is in Greek, not in Hebrew because they always burned the Hebrews when they'd copy them, and they burned them and burned them and burned them, and then the one we got now, they didn't start until about 90 A.D. rewriting it, so it's a reinvented one. This is the oldest one. 285 B.C. comes into existence, the conversation with the Greeks. In Palestine, Alexander the Great, after he dies, his three generals divide up his empire. They've got a pretty good general, takes over Egypt, named Ptolemy, You've got a different general named Antiochus Epiphanes who's going to take over this area. And Antiochus, I think of that, uh, built a city called Antioch. So that's where we get our city Antioch from Antiochus. Uh, he is really wanting to push the Greek point of view on these stubborn Jews and Palestine, and they're resisting him because they just got spanked pretty hard and spent 70 years, a couple hundred years ago, in Babylon, and they don't want to go again. I will be your God, I will, you will be my people. We're not too keen on worshiping Zeus. So in time, he sends his troops into town, storms Jerusalem, conquers the city. Uh, puts a statue of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, slaughters a pig on the altar. How to win friends and influence people in two easy lessons. <laughs> this is the... Uh, I just 
went blank on the phrase from the book of Daniel about the abomination of desolation or something like that. That's the prophecy. Really, people are still thinking it's going. It's already happened. And Tychus did it when he did his dad in, in, in the revolt. And in response to that, Judas the Hammer. Well, that's a good wrestler's name, isn't it? <laughs> Judas the Hammer. Uh, Maccabees means hammer. Uh, he and his sons lead the revolt, the insurgency movement, to kick the Greeks out, to kick the, the, these guys out and be Jewish again. And so this will be the Maccabean revolt that ultimately will lead to inviting the Romans into town in 63 with Pompey. And of course, when the Romans came in, they never left. Uh, and so we now have the Roman occupation of Palestine, which brings us to 4 B.C., the birth of Christ. I know we say zero. That was the best they could do when they tried to go backwards and pick when he was born. But more than likely, he was, they missed it by four years, and he would have been born, and Christ was born in 4 B.C. That means that you would have had the crucifixion and resurrection in around 30 A.D., the birth of the church. We'll talk about it now. Christianity, our beliefs, those things starting next. Now that we've got Christ in our story, we can talk more and more about us as Christians in the story. The, the Jews will continue to uh, grow exasperated over Roman rule, and by 70 AD they will launch a massive revolt against Roman authority. Uh, the Romans know how to put out an insurgency. You just send in a million soldiers and kill everybody. You, you could stop an insurgency real quick if you've got the will to just send in enough troops and plow them down, and so they did. And they completely destroyed uh, Palestine, they destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now there begins to be, inside of Judaism, a huge tug of war. There was already tension after 30 AD between this small group of Jews called Christians and the larger group of Jews led by the rabbis. And after 70 AD, see before then, it was a hodgepodge in Jerusalem. You would have had Essenes, these are the monastics, living out in the desert. You would have had Sadducees. I love Father Constantine saying Sad, uh, Sadducees. <laughs> I don't know what to call them. I just grew up calling them Sadducees, so I'll stick with it, I guess. But anyway, the Sadducees. And uh, these would have been the liberals. You want to serve me pork? Yeah, right, I'll come over to your house. I don't care what the barbecue is. And, and then you had the Pharisees. These are the super fundamentalist guys. I'm going to wash five times. I pressed against you. I'm now unclean. Yikes. This kind of stuff. You would have had the zealots. These are the political activists agitating. Come on now. Let's get rid of the Romans and so forth. You would have had the, I think it's the Sicarii, if I spell it right or remember it right. These are the Dagobah. These are the assassins. These are the suicide bombers of that day. They had knives in their garments and come up and slip the knife into the back of a soldier or into the back of a fellow Jewish citizen if they thought you were collaborating with the enemy. And so, and then you would have had, you know, your, your Lions Club, the Kiwanis, uh, <laughs> Chamber of Commerce groups and so forth. And, you know, everybody. Well, and, and then, of course, you got this, this group of Christians over here. After the, and, and nobody seemed to mind as long as the temple was here because as long as we got the temple, the religion is established. You can believe whatever you want. We've got the solidarity of the temple to guarantee our worship. But wow, after 70 AD, the temple's gone. We no longer have the rock of the faith. And essentially after 70 AD, for all intents and purposes, only two groups are going to survive. And that's going to be the Pharisees will survive and the Christians. And you now have a tug of war inside Judaism between rabbinic Judaism 
and Christian Judaism. Both claiming to be the true continuation of what God has been doing with them all along. The Christians are running around saying, God interrupted Abraham, God interrupted Isaac, God interrupted Jacob, God interrupted Joseph, God interrupted Moses on the backside of nowhere, and on and on and on and on, and God interrupted the myrrh-bearing women going to the funeral of Christ, and the resurrection has interrupted all of our lives. This is the same God that we have been following and serving throughout all of our history, and this God has acted in our lifetime, here already, now already, and we are obeying Him and following Him. Well, this is still a small group inside Judaism, maybe 5%. And at the Council of Jamia in 90 AD, the rabbis will meet and will officially kick us out of Judaism. You cannot be a Christian Jew. You cannot come to the synagogue. You've got uh, a, a, a beginning of that beginning to happen prior to this, but it happens officially in 90 AD. When you read the story of the man born blind in the Gospel of John, what is it, chapter 9, and we just had it the other day as one of our readings, uh, his parents would not answer the Pharisees because they were afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue. And so you begin to have that pressure put on, and it becomes official in 90 AD. And in 90 AD, what the rabbis did was essentially two things. One, they abandoned the conversation with the Gentile world. They took the Septuagint in Greek and gave it to us, the Christians. And they said, we're going to start rewriting our writings all in Hebrew and they started and eventually created the Masoretic text that I think the oldest copy may be by 1100 or 1400 A.D. before it was done uh, to give us today the Jewish Bible, the Tanaka. But we Christians continued the conversation begun in Alexandria and instead of it being a conversation between Moses and Plato, it became a conversation between Christ and Plato. And armed with the Septuagint, armed with this Deuteronomic history, that I will be your God and you will be my people, I will dwell among you and I will put my spirit among you, I will live in you. And that in these last days he has come not as a prophet, but as a son, and has sent his son. And with the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, armed with that, they went into the Roman Empire, and within 300 years they converted the Roman Empire. So from Moses to Christ, it is a thrilling story. And it is the story that says Christianity is the true Israel. That's not a hypothetical statement. It's not a political statement. It is a historical statement that says we are the legitimate continuation. And while there may not be one of us in this room that has Jewish blood in us, we have been grafted into a Jewish tree and to a Jewish story. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our grandparents, not only, they would be our grandparents theologically because we have been grafted into them. Adam and Eve are our grandparents genetically. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is our story. This is our history. Just like I'm a member of this church and it was founded by a Lebanese group that came from a little bitty, little bitty village in southern Lebanon. And every time I tell the story when I give the tours, I say, we came. <laughs> we started the church because it's now, I'm grafted in here. And if I had been in St. George, I would have been grafted into the Greek community there and that Greek ethos. That's, that's how it works. 
There's only one story here. And it's the story of this God in search of a people who will be his people so he can be their God. Which is why I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us, Neolithic species, mankind, us, and for our salvation, the salvation of our species, came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made one of us and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God bless you for being here. I look forward to being here again next week. We have three sessions left. We're going to do eight after all. And I look forward to exploring the rest of what we believe together as